formally, I welcome you to St. Louis University. My name is Dr. James Ginther. I am the chair of the Department of Theological Studies, and it is my privilege to, uh, to organize this evening, and uh, I hope we will have a very enjoyable time with our guest speaker. I've asked my colleague, um, Dr. Julie Pamela Rubio, uh, Professor of Theological Ethics in the department, to introduce uh, our guest. And so, Julie, would you come? This is really beautiful to look at, to be honest I just wanted to say that. We're just so happy. Um, this is the 56th annual Bellarmine Lecture at SLU. It was started um, in 1956. There were a couple names missing at the beginning. There was an incredible list of theologians, um, including Richard McCormick, George Lindbeck, John Newman, David Tracy, Elizabeth Schusler, Fiorenza, Sandra Schneider. It's, it's an incredible list to which we add tonight. Um, we are so pleased to welcome Elizabeth Johnson, CSJ, who is the Distinguished Professor of Theology at Fordham University. She was one of the first women to receive a doctorate of theology at the Catholic University of America. Her work in systematic theology is in systematic theology, and she focuses on the language we use to speak about God. Her many books include She Who Is, The Mystery of God and Feminist Theological Discourse, The Quest for the Living God, and consider Jesus, as well as influential books on Mary and the communion of saints. Her work has inspired a generation of men and women, but especially women, who could, through her work, imagine themselves as women in the church and even as theologians. And to her, we are, we are very grateful for that gift. Tonight, she'll speak about her new book, Ask the Beast, Darwin and the God of Love. Elizabeth Johnson's work is important to so many because she insists that God is beyond all imagining and shows how the Christian tradition has more diverse ways of, of naming the mystery of God than we might think. And in her lecture tonight, she seeks to mine the tradition once again, asking, is God's charity broad enough for the bears? Elizabeth Johnson. So good evening, everyone. Good evening. And a special thank you to the students who have given up their seats and are sitting on the floor. Yes. We envy you your youth, and we are grateful. <laughs> so the subject of this lecture tonight, and I am most privileged to join that group of the 55 presenters who went before me on the Bellarmine Lecture Circuit, uh, the topic is, the subject is, is God's charity broad enough for bears? <laughs> the subject of our reflection this evening is the natural world, and our particular focus is the ecological crisis. Every day brings more disastrous headlines, as you know. Land, sea, and air polluted, ice caps melting, species going extinct all because of human behavior that is rendering our planet unfit for life, structurally unhealthy. Without belaboring this point, know that this is the context of this lecture. Now thanks to its heritage of Jewish creation faith, the Christian tradition believes in one living God who creates the heaven and earth and all that is in them, Hence, the natural world gets a different name in Christian theology. It isn't just called nature, it's called creation, which is a religious word that signifies nature's relationship to God. It is a matter of some puzzlement why people who believe that nature is God's good creation have not stepped forward more vigorously to protect it. Part of the difficulty is that in recent centuries, creation itself has largely disappeared from church teaching, preaching, theology, and ritual. I don't know what your experience might be, but perhaps you can verify this from your own observation. When is the last time you heard a homily about creation? It seems that the natural world does not occupy pride of place in the religious imagination of ordinary folk. 
anymore. And hence, it is low on the list of priorities in terms of people's ethical concern. A provocative story by the American naturalist John Muir crystallizes the problem. Once when Muir was hiking in the Yosemite wilderness, he came upon a dead bear. He stopped to reflect on this creature's dignity, an animal with warm blood and a heart that beats like ours, an animal whose fur was ruffled by the wind, who rejoiced in a sunny day and when he found a bush filled with berries. Later, he wrote a bitter entry in his journal, criticizing the religious folk he knew, who made no room in their faith for such noble creatures. And I quote, they think they are the only ones with souls, the only ones for whom heaven is reserved. And he continued, to the contrary, God's charity is broad enough for bears. So is it? What do you think? Is the God you believe in madly, passionately in love with bears, with birds, with deer and raccoons and beavers, with the black walnut and maple trees, the catfish, trout, and bass in the local streams and lakes? This is our question tonight. And the method that we will follow toward an answer comes from the biblical book of Job. And it sets us off on a new kind of an exploration. Job says, quote, ask the beasts and they will teach you. Speak to the birds of the air and they will tell you. Ask the plants of the earth and they will instruct you. And the fish of the sea will declare to you who among these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In God's hand is the life of every living thing and the breath of every human being. That's Job chapter 12. Ask the beasts is our method. And we have work to do here because many discussions of the ecological crisis whether in scientific literature or philosophical or theological literature, consider the other creatures solely in terms of their meaning for us, their usefulness for us humans. We are doing our theology looking in the mirror and seeing ourselves reflected back. We've been very anthropocentric for centuries. But it is time now to look out the window when we do theology and ask the beasts what their meaning is and listen for a moment to hear their answer. I'm going to suggest tonight that we need to listen first with a scientific ear, secondly with a theological or religious ear, and then with both ears together. And I am making a wager that this might shed some light on Muir's claim about God's charity for bears with good effect on our charity as well. So first, the scientific answer. Where do all plants and animals come from? When Charles Darwin published his book On the Origin of Species in 1859, the common answer was that every species comes directly from the hand of God the Creator and remains unchanged throughout time. Not only was this the view of religion, but it was the view of the scientific establishment as well, which boggles the minds of us in the 21st century. Darwin himself learned this position from his science professors at Cambridge University. However, by studying fossils and living creatures in South America and other destinations, he came to a different conclusion. Namely, that species originate from other species through small changes made over deep eons of time. 
that the whole magnificent array of animals and plants and humans emerged gradually over hundreds of millions of years, one species branching out from another over endless generations. Not until the sixth edition of this book, 13 years later, did he call this process evolution. His preferred term was descent with modification. Now in a nutshell, the evolutionary chain of events goes something like this. Now and then, living organisms produce variations. Today we call these genetic mutations. Some of these can be inherited. Some variations increase an animal or plant's ability to get food and thus to survive and reproduce. These changes go onwards into the next generation, eventually spreading through a whole population. The variations which do not give such an advantage do not get passed on to the next generation and eventually die out. For example, a chance mutation may increase the toughness of a bird's bill ever so slightly. If the area's major food source is a hard seed, the tougher bill will result in more nourishment for the bird and more successful egg laying. More birds will be born with tougher bills. Beaks with weaker bills will eventually fade out. And over millennia of such changes, new species emerge from ancestral parents, small beneficial changes over millions of years. Now Darwin brilliantly explained this process by analogy with human behavior. He noted how many of his British Victorian contemporaries worked hard to breed new types of roses, cattle, strawberries, pigeons, etc. And breeders still do that. When a desirable trait appeared, they selected it and tried to reproduce it in the next generation. He figured nature was doing the same thing, selecting the best of what was presented to it by random <coughs> mutations. So he called the law that governs evolution, natural selection, as compared to human selection. Adding complexity to the theory, Darwin thought that natural selection has a right and a left hand that amplify its outcomes. On the one hand, divergence, and on the other hand, extinction. Divergence refers to the tendency of one species to split into multiple new species that spread apart rather than one species simply morphing straight as an arrow into another one. Ducks and hawks, for example, both descend from one ancestral bird species. Today, ducks are fitted to diving in water for their food, while hawks are adapted to swooping through air. Divergence operates on the premise that more life can flourish in an area if organisms draw food from resources in different ways. And so evolution slowly brought forth the duck and the hawk. You know that cartoon that frequently reproduced of, of a creature crawling out of the water, walking up a hill, and becoming progressively more human until at the very top you have a man? And I know it is always a man <laughs> who emerges. <laughs> um, whenever you see that, cartoon in the future, say to yourself, not. Because that's, that, is, that does not give credence to divergence. Okay. Now on the other hand, extinction. This refers to the disappearance of an older species once its offspring become better adapted to survive in changing circumstances. The death of individuals through predation and the death of species through extinction arose naturally as an essential element in a tremendously powerful process of bringing forth new life. Many once thriving species are now extinct, while better adapted ones have taken their place. 
one could have a theological discussion right here on Paul's statement that because of sin, death entered the world. But you would have to say today, Paul did not know the story of evolution. Nor could he have. Death was in the world way before humans evolved and began to sin. Scientists figure that before human beings appeared, the natural background rate of extinctions of all species added together was one a year. So a species emerged, lived out its life, gave forth to progeny of a variety of ways, and it ultimately disappeared. So expand this pattern of repeated branching and forking, variations and new births, dying and extinction, to every species alive at the same time, all interacting under the pressure of natural selection in a changing environment. With millions of stops and starts, dead ends and successful advances, the beautiful array of life that we see around us today is the result, including ourselves. Now Darwin's fertile imagination depicted the story of evolution as a great tree of life. He wasn't a good artist, but he did scribble out these little drawings of the tree every now and then. Step back and picture a spreading evolutionary tree. The outer layer of budding twigs and green leaves represent the multitudes of species alive today, topping out in the sun. Below are layers of dead and broken branches that once lived, giving rise to new species to which they passed on their characteristics and which they now support. This image makes clear the intimate relationship of all organic beings on Earth to one another. We are kin and form one community of life. This quote from Darwin, I think, gives our imagination much to work on in this regard. It's a little bit long, but it's very interesting. I quote, what can be more curious than that the hand of a man formed for grasping the paw of a mole formed for digging, the leg of a horse, the paddle of a porpoise, the wing of the bat, should all be constructed in the same pattern and should include the same bones in the same relative positions. On the ordinary view of the direct creation of each being, we can only say, it has so pleased the creator to construct each animal this way. But if we suppose an ancient progenitor had its own limbs arranged this way, then all the descendants inherited the pattern. The bones might be enveloped in a thick membrane to form a paddle to swim, or a thin membrane to form a wing, or they may be lengthened or shortened for some profitable purpose. But there will be no tendency to alter the framework. Indeed, the same names can be given to the bones in widely different animals. And he ends, what a grand natural system formed by descent with slight modifications. Now, let me just interpose here a reflection about evolution. Over, for over a century in the United States, there has been conflict between this theory of evolution and religion. People who read the book of Genesis literally take it to be revealing that God made all the world's creatures directly in six days, a position which is contradicted by the evolutionary story. If one reads Genesis according to its own literary genre, however, it becomes clear that this text is not a science book. It is teaching religious, not scientific truth. Genesis indeed reveals that God creates everything that exists, but it does not intend to tell us how. This is left for human intelligence to discover. I recall that Pope John Paul II ended up on the front page of the New York Times in 1996 when he said that there were significant arguments in favor of the theory of evolution. I lost my place here. 
His own perspective comes from the theological tradition that sees faith and reason working together, not in conflict. So faith shows us that God creates the world, and reason in our last 150 years has figured out how. What, what the Catholic tradition at least says about this is, God creates the world in, with, and through the natural causes that are created, and thereby creates the world by empowering the world to make itself. God creates the world by empowering the world to make itself. Now, if we just listen to the beast tell us, the plants, the fish, the uh, birds of the air, where did they come from? This is the story they're going to tell us today. Right? Over millions of years, the first original ancestor in the ancient seas is thought to have arisen three and a half billion years ago. And through all that period of time, all these changes have taken place and finally have brought forth all of these magnificent species today. So I think we could stop right here and we could ponder with amazement the dynamic process of evolution that has brought forth all of life on this planet. But the fact is that the tree of life is in trouble. Human behavior is breaking off its twigs, thinning out the canopy, in places, even bringing evolution on Earth to a halt. How are we doing this? Three ways. Increased human population, overconsumption of resources, and pollution with poisons and sewage. This is ruining ecosystems, which means we are disrupting the homes where other creatures find food and reproduce. As a result, Many thousands of species are disappearing. By a conservative estimate, in the last quarter of the 20th century, 10% of all living species went extinct. And the dying continues. If the average background rate before humans appeared was one a year, one extinction a year, Edmund O. Wilson, the biologist at Harvard, has estimated Right now, in the rainforest alone, 23,000 species a year are going extinct. We are killing birth itself, wiping out the future of our fellow creatures who took millions of years to evolve. And the picture darkens as we attend to the deep-seated connection between ecological devastation and social injustice for poor people suffer disproportionately from environmental impoverishment. In the blunt language of the World Council of Churches, quote, the stark sign of our times is a planet in peril at our hands. This is a critical moment that needs all hands on deck. And so I propose that in addition to evolutionary science, Religious traditions have resources that can make a vital contribution. All religions are addressing the ecological challenge in some fashion. I speak from the perspective of the Christian tradition, and from that stance I ask, how can belief that this evolving world, gorgeous and distressed, is created by God, how can this belief foster a spirituality that makes loving the earth an intrinsic part of our faith in God, rather than an add-on. And so we listen with our second ear to the beast's religious answer. A surprise awaits those who probe even a little into the doctrine of creation. Ordinarily, people take creation to refer to what happened in the beginning, and thus relegated to the past. But creation means much more than that. Classical theology speaks of creation in three senses. And I will give it to you in Latin, and I will guarantee that you will get it. Okay. There's creatio originalis, creatio continua, and creatio nova. That is creation in the beginning, continuous creation, throughout time and new creation at the redeemed end time. 
original creation. At the outset, being created means that plants and animals receive their life as a gift from God and exist in utter reliance on that gift. In ultimate terms, they do not bring themselves into existence. Their very being here at all relies on the overflowing generosity of the Creator who freely shares life with the world. Continuous creation. In addition to their origin in God's love, plants and animals continue to be held in life and empowered in every moment by the giver of life. Without this sustaining presence, they would sink back into nothingness. You might ask yourself if you think God retired after the six days of creation <laughs> and did nothing in the meantime, you see. But continuous creation maintains that divine creativity is active here, now, and in the next minute, or there would be no world at all. We'll return to this in a moment. And new creation, creatio nova. The God of life continues to draw the world into a future pervaded by a radical promise, namely, that at the ultimate end of time, the creator of all will not abandon the world, but will recreate it anew, transforming it in an unimaginable way into communion with divine life. The Bible concludes with this promise, quote, Behold, I make all things new, end quote. So being created means that living creatures are the bearers of this great and hopeful promise. So the threefold meaning of the classical doctrine of creation, past, present, and future, clearly renders the natural world religiously significant in terms of its own relationship to God. Note that this relationship existed for billions of years, long before human beings evolved on the African savanna. Hominids emerged about two million years ago, and our own species, Homo sapiens, between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, just a drop in the bucket. Right? Sometimes, with my students, I push them. I said, what do you think God was doing for three and a half billion years before we came along, <coughs> twiddling the divine thumbs, waiting for us to get here to sin so he could save us? You know, that's like, I don't think so. Uh, my point is, creation is not only all about us. <laughs> now let us consider more deeply the second dimension. Continuous creation entails that God is ever presently active, holding up and empowering creatures at every moment. Herbert McCabe, the Dominican philosopher from Great Britain, brings this insight home with a beautiful metaphor, and I quote him. The creator makes all things and keeps them in existence from moment to moment, not like a sculptor who makes a statue and then can leave it alone, but like a singer who keeps her song in existence at all times. Now, what kind of art is it? Make it and walk away, or well, performance art, that you have to keep singing, you see. Now, theology has traditionally spoken about this presence of God, the singing, continuous creation, in the language of the Spirit, the Creator Spirit, the Holy Spirit, the one whom the Nicene Creed calls the Lord and giver of life. In Latin, that's vivificantem, the vivifier. The Spirit of God indwells the world and is present in all things as the ineffable, energizing power of life. I think you have somewhere come across this doctrine of the indwelling of the Spirit in the world. We're pressing that now. To appreciate this dynamic presence, the Bible often refers to images that compare the creative spirit to natural things, blowing wind, flowing water, blazing fire. Let us for a moment consider fire. Prized for its gifts of warmth and light, but also at times uncontrollably dangerous, fire symbolizes the presence of the divine in most of the world's religions. 
Lighting candles or lamps or burning incense is a typical ritual act around the world. So too in the Bible, fire often signifies the presence of the divine. You might recall the burning bush where Moses encountered the God of Abraham sending him to lead the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt. Or you might recall Pentecost when tongues as of fire descended on Jesus' disciples and they were inspired to go out and preach. Now all through the Bible, the approach of the fire of the Spirit for human beings always signals the coming of grace, of refreshment, liberation, healing, comfort, love, boldness. And as in the human world, so too in nature. The whole of creation is pervaded and lit up and energized by the fire of the Spirit. Listen to two medieval theologians talk about this. The first is Hildegard of Bingen, the 12th century. She channels the giver of life this way, and I quote, I, the highest and fiery power, have kindled every living spark. I flame above the beauty of the fields. I shine in the waters. In the sun, the moon, and the stars, I burn. And by means of the airy wind, I stir everything into quickness with a certain invisible life which sustains all. I, the fiery power, lie hidden in these things, and they blaze for me." End quote. This is the poetic imagination of the mystic. Now translating the biblical use of fire and mystical intuitions about divine presence into more rational discourse, we have Thomas Aquinas. He presents a clear conceptual basis for the same subject. He asks the question whether God is in all things. And again, let me read you his exact words, or as exact as they can be translated from the Latin. Uh, as he speaks on this point, and note again the analogy of fire. Quote, I answer that God is in all things, not indeed as part of their essence, nor as an accident, but as an agent is present to that upon which it works. Now since God is very being by his own essence, created being must be his proper effect just as to ignite is the proper effect of fire. Now God causes this effect in things not only when they first begin to be, but as long as they are preserved in being, as air is caused in the, uh, as light is caused in the air by the sun, as long as the air remains illuminated. Therefore, as long as a thing has being, God is present to it. But being is innermost in each thing and most fundamentally inherent in all things. Hence, it must be that God is in all things and innermostly. There's the argument. Just as fire ignites things and sets them on fire, the Spirit of God continuously ignites the world into being. This metaphor, I suggest, is akin to the one of the singer singing her song. The symbol of fire and the shining sun bespeak the innermost presence of the spirit in the creatures of the natural world on planet Earth, empowering their evolutionary advance. And now, in light of this theology of the spirit indwelling, continuously creating the world, it becomes clear that the inner secret of ecological communities of plants and animals is the dwelling of the Spirit of God within them. In the light of creation, they are profoundly related to God on their own terms. Therefore, instead of being distant from what is holy, the evolving world of life bears the marks of the sacred, being imbued with a spiritual radiance. This is not to say it is divine, but in its own vital integrity, 
suffering, death, and new advances. It is pervaded, vivified, and encompassed by the Spirit of God. This is why today theologians say the natural world is sacramental. It bodies forth and communicates the gracious presence of God. It's also why we say that the natural world is revelatory. It discloses something of the divine wisdom, beauty, power, and love. If we listen well, we can even hear the plants and animals praising God, as some of the Psalms depict. So from the spiraling galaxies to the double helix of the DNA molecule, the universe is energized by the Spirit's quickening power. <coughs> you may begin to see how the logic of creation, when interpreted within the power of the theology of the Holy Spirit, indeed supports the view that God's charity is broad enough for bears. Now let me bring this to a challenging point. And this is the ethical imperative that arises out of this kind of reflection. Looked at from both the scientific and the religious perspectives, and now we're listening with both ears, the current destruction of life on Earth by human action has the character of a deep failure. To speak scientifically, we are wiping out the fruit of millions of years of evolution on Earth and shutting down its future. As some writers are now saying, children born into the world today inhabit a thinner natural world than we did. There are fewer species here. The killing continues. To speak philosophically, this is a moral failure, and ethicists have coined new words to name the violence. Echocide, geocide, biocide. And to speak theologically, this destruction is sinful. It is profoundly sinful, contradicting the will of the creator whose beloved creation this is. Sacrilege and desecration are not too strong a designation, and Pope John Paul II, in his letter on the World Day of Peace in 1990, called it exactly that, sacrilege and desecration. The Catholic bishops of the Philippines even named the despoilation an insult to Christ. And I quote from their pastoral letter, the destruction of any part of creation, especially the extinction of species, defaces the image of Christ which is etched in creation. Whatever the language, the judgment remains that the ecological damage humans are wrecking on the earth is profoundly wrong. Now in Christian terms, the move from sin to a life marked by grace is called conversion. This entails a turning, a change of direction, switching away from one path and swiveling toward another. Facing ecological ruination, people who believe in God the Creator today need a deep conversion to the earth. Unlike previous spiritualities where you turned away from the earth to find God by ascending to heaven, this is a reverse, a conversion to God by being converted to the earth which God so loves. And I propose that this conversion involves three turnings at once, intellectual, emotional, and finally ethical. Intellectually, it entails moving from a human-centered view of the world to a wider theocentric one that has room for other species to be included in the circle of what is religiously meaningful. It means letting go of a philosophy shaped by hierarchical dualism that prizes spirit over matter in favor of one that intensely values physical and bodily realities as God's good creation. Rather than setting up a contrast of either or relationship between God and the world, this intellectual turning honors the presence of the giver of life 
in, with, and under ecological communities of species and sees the creator reflected in their flourishing. Emotionally, being converted to the earth involves turning from the delusion of the separated human self and the isolated human species to a felt affiliation with other beings who share our common status as creatures of God. The beautiful words of Albert Einstein, and I quote, our task must be to free ourselves from our egotistic prison by widening the circle of our compassion to embrace all living creatures and the whole of nature in its beauty, end quote. So in the depths of our being, we need to recover a capacity for communion with the natural world to the point where brother sun and sister moon, brother fire and sister water, brother wolf and little sister bird are more than poetic ways of speaking, but felt truths as with Francis of Assisi. Ethically, conversion makes us realize that a moral universe limited to human persons is no longer adequate. We need to extend our moral consideration to the whole community of life. An excellent lead for action comes from a radical principle articulated by Pope John Paul II in his letter I mentioned before in 1990. And I will quote you, it's, it's at the very last paragraph of the letter. It sums up his whole teaching. Quote, respect for life and for the dignity of the human person must extend also to the rest of creation, which is called to join humanity in praising God. I know when I was first reading that letter and I saw the words respect for life and the dignity of the human person, one thought it was going to go to right to life issues, abortion and so on. And that's not in any way excluded, but it is extended to all of life, it must extend to the rest of creation. So some theologians are talking about God, Jesus teaching to love God with all your heart and soul and your neighbor as yourself, who is my neighbor? Jesus told the parable of the Good Samaritan, the one in need, left beaten by the side of the road, and the Samaritan helps him. Well, the right whale who's being hunted to extinction is my neighbor, etc. Extended to the rest of creation. This calls into play the rich tradition of moral right and wrong, virtue and sin, already so well developed in terms of the dignity of the human person in Catholic teaching, and invites its challenging application to this new set of lives. Reciprocity, rather than rapaciousness, begins to mark our relationship with the earth. Simply put, both ears are telling us that ecological conversion means falling in love with the earth as an inherently valuable living community in which we participate and bending every effort to be creatively faithful to its well-being in tune with the God who loves it unconditionally. Being converted to the earth, I mean, entails more than an ascetic or a moral turning. It's a call to a deeper relationship to God, the creator of heaven and earth, a relationship that transforms us into great-heartedness toward other creatures, in union with the love who made and empowers it all. So to conclude, a flourishing humanity on a thriving earth filled with life in an evolving universe altogether filled with the glory of God. This is the global vision that we are called to at this critical age of Earth's distress. Our goal should be to establish and protect socially just and environmentally sustainable societies in which the needs of all people can be met and species in their natural environment can prosper onward to an evolutionary future that can still surprise. In my judgment, 
ignoring the ethical call to be converted to the earth, keeps churches, temples, synagogues, and so on locked in irrelevance, while a terrible drama of life and death is being played out in the real world. By contrast, Living the ecological vocation, that's another phrase from John Paul II's letter. Living the ecological vocation sets us off on a grand adventure of mind and heart as a community, expanding the repertoire of our love, even for theirs. before the reception. Mm -hmm. And so let's have some conversation over this. What do you think, or what else would you like to raise? Or what, what do you not agree with, or want to hear more about, etc.? OK, please, over there. Sitting down? Yeah. That's you. Yep. Thank you for a lovely lecture. Um, What I, what, I, what I want to hear more about is uh, what kind of prophetic witness do those who believe in God have to give to the techno sciences? Because in a way, it's, it's the thinning out of the, of, the, of the universe to where there's merely material factors at work, causes and effects that kind of play themselves out, that kind of lead to a kind of scientific, mechanistic understanding. So if there's reverence needed, it might need to come out, uh, uh, might need to be that the scientists need to uh, re-mystify nature or re-mystify creation. Um, and so what, you know, what, how, how do we begin to have that conversation as those of us who can reverence in a kind of pious sort of theological way with those who cannot begin to engage nature in that way? Okay, as you were speaking, I thought, wow, listen to this question. I would like to say three quick things. One is, I don't think it's fair, or to repeat the question, let me see if I have this right. Um, those who reverence nature because of God, what kind of prophetic action can we take, or should we take, to convince scientists who are materialistic in their assessment of nature that they need to reverence nature and remystify it? Did I get that right? Okay. All right, so the first quick thing I would say back is I myself don't agree with you that scientists um, have a mechanistic approach to nature. Some, of course, do. But to make a black and white like that, because I am hearing scientists such as Stephen J. Gould, Carl Sagan, um, Stephen Hawkins, etc., atheists all have a tremendous reverence for nature because of their study, because of what they know that it's done. The scientific ear has heard this, you see. And there have been calls on the part of scientists to religious people, even though we disagree with regard to the ultimate, namely God, but to pool our resources for protection of the earth, because we both have that as a value, although we come at it from different ways. That's the first thing I would say. Uh, the second thing I would say is, where there is a mechanistic assessment of nature, at which some, let's say, if you're just in a lab and that's all you're doing, the mathematical quantitative experiments and so on and so forth. I don't know if prophetic witness is the, is the right thing that we need to do there. I think there needs to be an awful lot of education and uh, conversation and, and bringing what they're doing in the lab into a wider perspective that's poetic and beautiful and meaningful in their own, but that they can see that. But where there is prophetic, and this is my third point, action that needs to be taken, if I may be so bold as to say, is with regard to corporations. Because the greatest way that nature is being despoiled today is through commerce, through business. And this connects with the social justice piece that I mentioned briefly in there. The, the uh, evacuation of resources from undeveloped nations leaves people without sustainable agriculture, without their own resources. And in the end, we first world people benefit from that. Our lifestyle is enormously luxurious. 
on the backs of other species and of poor people. And that's where we need to use all the prophetic uh, skills that we have to challenge that. You know, the profit motive becomes more important the way we do business rather than to protect life and to protect human life as well. So I think until we, still we really look at the fact, where is the damage happening and why, and not just have a generic idea it's because of science, that the actual doing of it, the cutting down, the logging, the polluting, etc., is happening because of profit. So it's business that we need to get, get engaged with. Please. Uh, uh, for many years, Native American, Native people, uh, indigenous people, has been called uh, pagan or evil because it's their reverence to the creation. So in this ethical conversion, do you think that, or how we can uh, turn to them and uh, somehow redeem what has been done to them and to learn from people who still among us and has been always in this reverence and connection and unity. Right. That, that's an extremely good point. And that, in fact, is what's, what again is being proposed. You know, um, indigenous people in Australia, their relationship to the land, Native Americans, their relationship to the land, the encounter with the sacred there, and so on. Uh, what we're not suggesting is that we, in our own ways, adopt those religions. We are not indigenous, we are not Native Americans, but to learn from them something that will promote our own approach through our own tradition is definitely in the, in the cards. Yeah. Please. I came through the Ottawa education in the 70s. Uh, and it felt to me then like science was more integrated into the way I was being encouraged to think than it is today. And uh, I also felt like I was being encouraged to be speculative uh, in ways that were created much more than a common person is today. Uh, any comments about why that is and how we're going to, how we're going to get out of that box? Because it, it looks to me like many believers are withdrawn from science because ultimately the conceptual framework you need to put the two together is difficult. And uh, I wonder how we're going to get to a marriage again, intellectually, of science and faith. So just a little question about all of theological <laughs> education. <laughs> and now, you know, this is... This is yeah. I don't have a whole picture of what goes on in theological education everywhere today, but I do see an awful lot of dialogue being attempted. Um, I think in this country, I mean, Europeans come over here and they can't fathom why we get so upset about these issues with science. I think we're just crazy. You know? um, but, but what's very hopeful is that we are now, we realize we're in a crisis. And that, as I said, theology will go forward in utter irrelevance if it doesn't engage this way. Now, we've always been dialoguing, let's say, with history, historical discoveries, um, psychology in the 50s and 60s, those kind of things. And now the science we have about the creation of the universe. I mean, I was just talking about our little planet and life on our planet. But the whole history of the universe from the Big Bang onwards is so magnificent and so unexpected that it would end up with us here on this planet as a result of all that. It has an awful lot of people in religion and religious education beginning to include that kind of what's called the universe story into the way we understand teaching about God and the earth and the world. So my, my fear, and not fear, but what I started out was this all ferment is happening in theological education. It's not making its way into where people actually hear anything in the churches or the religious place wherever they go. You know, it, it doesn't make a great impression in terms of catechisms or religious education of young people. And this is where you know, anyone who has children of their own, as parents, you can bring that in, or is themselves an educator can bring that in. 
There's a great need, and that's what I was arguing for here. In the light of what we have in our own tradition, even, to say nothing of what we know about the Earth today, we have motivation upon motivation to bring this forward in an ethical way. Please. So own a church, own a school, and so on, go green. So what kind of heat and air conditioning is being used? What's the source of energy? What kind of cleaning materials are used? Are they, do they have chemicals? What do you do with your grounds? Are you using pesticides? And so on. So there's lots of ways to clean up our own house, if you will. That's, very, that's a practical answer, right? Another way is a number of liturgists are now experimenting with um, Eucharistic prayers that bring in creation. Now, none of them are approved, granted. <laughs> Yet. You know, one lives in hope, right? But, but they are, some of them, very beautiful, and they're using the biblical words about nature, which aren't only in the book of Genesis, and all through scripture. There's a rich heritage we have there. And bringing in ourselves within that community as we praise God and so on in the Eucharistic <coughs> prayer. Uh, there are a number of hymn writers that are bringing in hymns that you, and they, they can be used without, you know, official, uh, hymns are programmed uh, that you must use this hymn or that hymn. Uh, you could do that. There are other things you could do in terms, I mean, that churches can do religious education. Um, just raising the question uh, in a parish setting of some sort. Uh, in some ministry in which one is engaged, can begin to, it's in the air now, I think, in our own culture, uh, the People's Climate March, a few weeks ago in New York, and other places and so on, so that to say this is a religious issue, and you know you have the backing of the Pope and the bishops on this question, at least in the literature, in the, in the words that they've said, the writings they've given, that this, this can be brought forward by a lot of creative people, like yourself, I think, you know? Bring this in. There's ways to do it. It's not automatic, but it can be done. Please. I would just like to uh, add to that. Uh, we, our book club read a book called Radical Amazement. Uh -huh. and, uh, and, and one of the quotes of the book was, a waitress says, I'm not a waitress. This is not a bar. This is church. We tend to think of church as something we do on Sunday in a building, but church happens all the time. And I think this is kind of the answer to your question. The waitress says, I am not a waitress, and this is not a bar. This is church. <laughs> Has a lot of meanings, I think, there. Yes. <laughs> but, um, but church can happen in a lot of places and in a lot of contexts as well. So it isn't just that we need to reform the way we run our religious institutions or even at our homes do this. Because all of us together have a political clout and that is really what it has to happen. What kind of people do you vote for? Do they have an ecological agenda? Uh, do you bring pressure to bear on corporations for better practices, etc.? Those things together, one person can't pull that off, but all together, and those are also religious acts to do that kind of thing. Please. If you speak to what we call sometimes the dark side of nature, uh, evolution doesn't seem necessarily to have a preferential option for human life. It must have evolved by us as well. And how do we deal with that theologically? Right. The question of, if I may phrase it again, evil in the natural world, I mean, that's a traditional way of talking about it, natural evil. I mentioned that death arose in the course of evolution as an intrinsic part of the 
process. Uh, animals eat one another. In the process of trying to escape predation, they go through anatomical changes. Those who run faster survive better. Um, one, the, one scientist said, if there weren't death, if some species didn't disappear, some people, other creatures didn't disappear, in the end, there would be no room for evolution to continue. The old has to give way and the new come through. That's just become the law of life. And so what we do with that is to say, I think as we say with human evil, when we sin, we are committing, we're doing something that is against God's will when we sin. We're looking at nature. We're not saying nature sins because there's no choice there as we understand it. But what we say is this is the way nature has evolved and God has let it evolve that way. That this isn't by God's will that this kind of thing happens. It's the process, as I mentioned earlier, God working in, with, and through, and under these natural causes. And what I myself have struggled with is so much suffering, so much death in the animal kingdom, and you brought in the Ebola virus, therefore also in human life. There is no ultimate answer for this question. The question of evil is a mystery. Mysterium iniquitatum, and I don't use that word lightly. Ultimately, it doesn't make sense as we go along. But what we Christians bring to it is the story of Jesus Christ. And we have a God on the cross, a God who has suffered and died, right? And we believe Jesus, as the Word of God made flesh, God, this is not strange to God's own experience. And the resurrection brings hope that new life will come out of it. So to my mind, we don't have an answer, but we have a story and a hope. And that's the theological way I think going about it. So I want to write. Please. Uh, speaking about expansion and uh, only enough room for so many, in the story of creation at the very beginning, and God says, be fruitful and multiply to man. Uh, could you speak a bit more about uh, birth control and more specifically about developing countries and what could, could maybe be done in, in those places where families see nothing, no other option but to have uh, many children in order to be taken care of whenever they are older and the equal distribution and care for, uh, for the people. Right. God said to the first human couple, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and we have done it. <laughs> <laughs> Time to stop, right? As, as, <laughs> as John Hunt said, that's the one biblical injunction that we have certainly obeyed. <laughs> um, with regard to practical steps, as you mentioned in uh, third world countries, I'll just mention one thing and then I want to add something to the point you're raising, which is a really excellent one. Um, it has been demonstrated over and over and over again that if you improve the situation of women through education or through economic opportunity, the birth rate drops. So by whatever means you're doing that, the, the improvement of women themselves, women do not want to go through life pregnant. You know, and give them an opportunity to have more going on in their life, it, it begins to take care of itself as they work it out by whatever means. The thing that I found, and I was working on this in my book, um, Ask the Beast, that I had not ever realized before, and some of you ethicists here probably do know this, but it, um, Pope John Paul II, in his teaching on this, said, we must arrive at a morally correct level of birth. And that goes back to the Second Vatican Council, which gave parents the responsibility to choose how many children they were going to have, and in so deciding, they must take into account their own circumstances, the number of children they already have, the society in which they live, etc., etc. So it isn't a Catholic teaching that you must have as many children as you possibly can. Now, people think that that is a Catholic. But the, that phrase, a morally correct level of birth that we must arrive at, says to me, that means there must be a morally incorrect level of birth. 
And when you have one species like ours absolutely mushrooming its numbers on Earth and therefore crowding out the other species, that's the basic problem. Um, you could argue that we are arriving at that transition moment of incorrect level of birth, that the numbers, they will continue to rise to the middle of this century if barring any tragedy. Uh, astronomically, in 1950, this number always gets me, there were two billion people in the world. And that is from the beginning of when we first emerged on the African savanna. Okay. Um, in the millennium, they did another head count in the world, and there were six billion. I don't know if you remember that. So the, the human population had tripled in one half century. And in 2010, there was seven billion. So we had another billion added in a decade. And they're projecting by 2050, 10 billion. So now every one of these human persons needs a place to live, needs water, needs food, is going to consume resources. And at this point, we are pressuring other species with our own needs. And of course, our needs in first world countries then became way more than what we need for survival. And that puts even more pressure on it. There's just a great number of considerations. But I, I think it's important to know that according to Catholic teaching, um, it, is, it is moral to limit births. Now, of course, the argument is over how, right? But, but the, the, the doing of, of the limiting is, is part of what's morally responsible. Think about that, right? <coughs> OK, I think we have one more. Please, back there. So you talked about how the life is a crisis, and does this culture change? Um, I want to know what I can do practically as a college student in order to, as you said, fall in love with nature, fall in love with land, um, to combine the science and the animal What can you practically do? Okay. Go for a walk in Forest Park. <laughs> Go to the Missouri Botanical Gardens. I'm not kidding. Go to the zoo. In other words, have yourself experiences of this so that you yourself begin to feel part of it and that you love it. I think an awful lot of people already do that, you know. Then going forward, you can join any kind of effort at this university to make the university act more responsibly in an ecological way. And I say that coming from a university where we have a lot of arguments going on about recycling, about um, energy sources, and most especially here we go again into money, about divesting um, funds from the endowment that are fueling companies that to, to spoil the earth, to remove monies from that, which might be a little dated. In other words, both on the individual level as a person yourself, to, live, to try to have your footprint on Earth be light. Right? But also as a member of a community, to act politically. But to do all of that because of what you yourself are convinced of, uh, of, the, of the value of nature, which you yourself can love. Good. We have time for one more. Time for one more. OK, I'm here in the front. Kathy. Cosmos has uh, meant a whole rethinking of every uh, Christian doctrine that we have. Uh, could you say a word, if you can go uh, far enough, about the rethinking of original sin in light of the new cosmic story? Right. The question is clearly the turn to the cosmos is calling for a rethinking of every Christian doctrine, and that's very true. So can I say a word about original sin, right? I recall, I recall David Tracy's comment was he has no idea why anybody would ever want to deny that doctrine because it's the one doctrine for which we have evidence all around us. <laughs> but what you're talking about, I know, is Adam and Eve and that story again in Genesis. And we do with that story what we do with Genesis chapter 1 is interpret it according to its own genre. And a genre is a literary teaching of religious truth. It's also trying to figure out origins of the way things are. Why do women suffer in childbirth? Why do men have to work so hard in the fields, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. It's, it's a big question in theology today, you know, going on in, in uh, contentious ways. But basically, 
There never was a Garden of Eden. There never was a time when everything was perfect and somebody came along and spoiled it. We are, the way people say it today is that the garden is ahead of us. <laughs> it's still, it's an ideal toward which we are going, right? Because we came up, we evolved out of the hominid line, which itself evolved. I think the, the uh, date, five million years ago, the hominid and chimpanzee lines diverged. Five million years, and then the various hominid branches ultimately to Homo sapiens. And beyond us, I, I mean, we're not the end of it. I don't know where we go from here, but... The, um, and the idea is, original sin is referring to the fact that we are born into a world that is, there's wrongness in it. And it's here before us, before we come along. It affects us. And when we go to exercise our own freedom once we get to a certain age, we ourselves enter it by making bad choices. So that it's a condition of the human race as we find ourselves in this world. And even classical teaching on original sin never held that it was personal sin. Personal sin is what we did ourselves. This was the sin of the world, is how some theologians have begun to refer to it. That no one is born into a perfect family, a perfect nation, a perfect world. There's wrongness done here by others before us, and it's affecting our own use of freedom. And it affects everyone, you know? So it's a, it's a condition of being human on this planet as it has evolved, you know? So I think to take the Genesis story, and again, interpret it intelligently, not literally, but as teaching profound truths. I mean, one of my favorite parts of that story is after Eve and Adam eat the apple, or whatever it was, the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, um, hide when God comes along, walking in the evening. And he calls out and he says, where are you? And they're hiding. Now, isn't that true? You do something wrong and don't you want to, you feel ashamed and you hide, you know? And, and when he finds them hiding, he goes, you ate that fruit, you know, that's why you do. And it goes on like that. It's just filled with human wisdom about human beings in relation to each other and the natural world and to God. And to take it as a tremendous story of origin that's pointing to profound truth, although it itself is not historically accurate. It doesn't mean it isn't true. You know. So that original sin uh, from which we need to be redeemed is still very much in action here but it, it's not being supported necessarily in a, in a, what I say, an historicist interpretation of the myth. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, Elizabeth Dawson, thank you all for coming and joining us all night.